Well, welcome to Chapter 5 here. Um, we are continuing to go through our, our course. Um, we're getting close to the part where we can um, kind of branch out from this underlying information, but we still have to talk about criminal responsibility and the capacity to commit crime, which is our Chapter 5 that we're going to look at today, or this evening, or this morning, or whatever time you're listening to this. So, um, quickly, of course, there are some learning objectives uh, here. Nothing we need to concern ourselves too much. Let's jump into, um, as is proper for almost any study, some of the history behind these ideas. So traditionally, the question was, how did you determine the truth of a statement or of a situation? So one of the things, of course, that our ancestors relied upon was the intervention of God in the world. And by that I mean, I don't, I don't mean answering a prayer, I don't mean um, the, the, the great uh, watchmaker, as he's sometimes called by the Calvinist, that it's behind everything, but the sort of direct personal intervention you would often hear in, say, the biblical story of Moses uh, leading this, helping to lead the slaves out of Egypt with the assistance of God. Um, so it's unsurprising, particularly since uh, this is going to develop in a Christian Europe, that they took some of this, um, these ideas, and they, they put them together. And one of, the, um, one of the ideas they came up with was trial by ordeal. Uh, so an example of this uh, could be you, know, you took a heated rock, very hot rock, um, to the point where it would burn flesh almost. You would put it in someone's hand. They would have to clasp it and hold it tight, uh, swearing that they were telling the truth. And then they would release the rock uh, very often into a, sometimes uh, you would hear stories, I'm not sure this is true, into a bucket uh, of water or a, a cauldron or something of holy water so you could hear it sizzle. You then would bind up the wound. Um, and then a couple days later, you would unbind it. And if the wound was infected, it meant, well, they must have lied. But if they were telling the truth, it would be a miracle. The guy wouldn't have a burned hand or wouldn't have an infection. Therefore, he was telling the truth. Now, that's trial by ordeal. And there are, there are lots of permutations of that idea. But again, that relies upon the idea that God is going to miraculously intervene um, to make sure that what happens uh, is right. A slight extension and modification of that, and sometimes more familiar to us, is the idea of trial by combat or trial by battle. Um, so, in other words, here you, you have the idea that God will protect that which is right and just. So if two sides are competing, uh, then, you know, the shorthand there is the good guy wins. Um, you could sometimes have actually two people both making an accusation, uh, either an accusation of a crime, which is we're concerned about, but sometimes a civil lawsuit, I suppose. And then they would literally fight each other in some way. Or as it got more sophisticated, people could hire um, people to fight for them. And again, the idea was that since God would protect uh, and make sure that the outcomes were good, um, you know, the good guys always win, that uh, by winning, you would prove that your case was just and you should, you know, be rewarded. These seem a little silly to us now, but I don't, I don't think they're as silly as all that if you reflect upon the adversarial system as exists in the United States today. Well, the, the responsibility there was, was placed, if you want to think of it, on God to make sure the outcome is right. Um, but let's talk about the individual a little bit. Let's talk about his responsibility for his actions. So... Criminal responsibility and capacity are seen as things that can impact whether someone should or should not be held liable for something that happens, um, if we're talking about a, a civil case or if, if we're talking about should they be able to be found guilty, do they have the capacity. And the lack of capacity uh, means that uh, you can say that this person is not responsible for what they did. But society um, has to recognize this as a valid defense. We have to say, okay, at this point, you are not responsible for your actions. So when would these arise? Well, there's, there's three quick examples here on the second part of this slide. And the first one, I think, is the easiest to understand and the most self-evident, and that's an infant. 
if uh, I was just uh, reading the news uh, this week and a, a three-year-old child, four-year-old child maybe, got his hands on a gun and pulled the trigger and uh, shot someone. Uh, well, okay. Um, would you say, well, that's assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury. That three-year-old needs to be brought to trial. He needs to be rigorously cross-examined. And if he's found guilty, he needs to get a sentence. Oh, suppose he killed someone. He needs to be executed. Uh, you know, most of us would say, well, well no. Um, he's an infant. He doesn't understand right and wrong. He didn't understand what he was doing. So infant or infancy determined at the time the, the crime is committed. Um, it would be one of these excuses that we would say that you would lack capacity to commit the crime. Now further down that, and it, it took us a while to get here um, as a society and a civilization, is the idea that mental illnesses exist. Now physical illnesses manifesting themselves with overt symptoms are very easy to recognize. We can say, okay, someone that um, whose skin is turning or whose eyes are turning yellow has got jaundice. Uh, someone whose skin is rotting has gangrene. Um, this follows that. We believe that the illness is being caused now by a disease, uh, an infection, a bacteriological, a viral infection, a prion, whatever we're talking about. Well, at first, of course, manifestations of mental illness we thought were different. We thought that people were choosing in some ways to be mad and and you it really wasn't like a physical illness but of course the more we have advanced in medical science and our understanding the more we realize that some people um, when they uh, display aberrant mental behavior the reason for that is that they are suffering a physical illness which is manifesting in the organ of the brain quick example then um, if uh, someone has an infection uh, in, in the brain uh, and it is causing a very high fever. Um, so we would say, okay, we, we've diagnosed them. We can absolutely prove that this person has this bacteriological infection and they have an extremely high fever. And in this fevered state, they are having hallucinations and they, you know, they, they grab someone and shove him down. So if, if he was in his right mind, that would be an assault. That would be a crime. But most people would say, well, no, he didn't, he didn't understand what he was doing. He lacked the capacity because he was suffering from a mental illness, this fever causing this delusion or, or hallucination. Um, so it's not his fault. Now, of course, we can carry this even further when we have these, I would argue, much more subtle but much more devastating diseases like schizophrenia and people bipolar to some extent. People are suffering from delusions. They see things that aren't there or they interact with things that aren't there or, be, or believe things are true that are not true. And the reason they are believing those things is not um, because they're doing it willfully, but they are suffering from mental illness. Um, now, one of the, oops, excuse me, one of the things that we talk about is when we're using a defense. Okay, so preponderance of the evidence is a level of proof um, used in a defense. Now, in, in a courtroom, we're very often we're in a criminal courtroom, we're talking about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. But to prove that you are lack capacity, very often we are looking for a level of proof that doesn't go that high. So level of proofs um, generally make you believe uh, one person is telling the truth. We have the very, very l the lowest level, the, the simple civil level, which is preponderance of the evidence. And sometimes we use one called clear and convincing, which is the step up from preponderance of the evidence. And then for conviction of a crime, um, we require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Not that there's some doubt, but reasonable doubt. So if we talk about, well, what do you have to prove for insanity? What do I have to prove to show that someone had a mental illness that made them act in a particular way that was contrary to their nature or against their will or desire. And what we're going to say is that we've got to prove this by a preponderance of the evidence. It doesn't require we remove all doubt. Uh, and most states that have defenses, uh, the defense of the proof of what we usually plead is that the plea is called not guilty by reason of insanity. You're going to have to prove that you are 
um, insane. You're going to have to meet whatever standard in that state. And the Supreme Court of the United States, interestingly enough, um, has not mandated that you have insanity as a plea. But what they have said is we recognize that people who are mentally ill, um, particularly, and, and the terminology is unfortunate here if you look at Atkins v. Virginia, um, they say if someone is suffers a major mental illness or is substantially or critically um, retarded, and again, not, not the best terminology to use there, then we we can still convict them, we can still bring them inside the criminal justice system, but we can't execute them because, again, they kind of lack this capacity. So let, let's go back to our first example, the one that's kind of the easiest to see, and that's going to be infants or infancy. Under the English common law, from which America um, descends, essentially, um, the age of infancy ended at seven. So basically, all throughout you, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth year, you were an infant. The law would say you just don't have the mental capacity to formulate that intent to commit crime. Remember, we studied previously that um, most crimes you have the, the guilty mind, the physical act, and the unity or the concurrence of both of those. So you have mens re, the guilty mind, actus resus, the physical act. Here what we're saying is you can't, if you're under the age of seven in the common law, have this, okay? Now, um, today under civil law, we usually will, and it's up to each state to set it, we usually say, okay, for whatever offenses we're talking about, this is the age at which you're an infant. Now, North Carolina's typical age of infancy for minor offenses, okay, so something that is, you know, uh, misdemeanor assault, kicking, punching, spitting at someone. That would be 10 years of age. For felonies and some repeat offenses, we'll actually lower that um, down to our eighth birthday. So we kind of follow the common law. And sometimes you'll see six as the cutoff. But regardless of where we set that age, we I think we all will recognize that from the point you are born, okay, you go through a process of intellectual and mental development, you begin to understand the world better, you begin to understand responsibilities, you begin to take responsibilities. So uh, at a certain point we say, okay, you are now adult enough that you are responsible for your actions. And each state is going to be able to set what time that is. So how, how do we prove infancy? Well, um, as I said, under a an age, typically seven or eight, you can't be convicted of a crime. Um, most of the time, we're going to prove infancy very simply by introducing a birth certificate or introducing evidence of someone's age. Now, of course, we then get into issues of, well, what about um, individuals who are above the age of infancy, but they really don't seem to be an adult yet. And this is going to be the status of a juvenile. So between the ages of 7 and 14, um, most of the time we're going to presume you're incapable of committing a crime, but you're going to be able to overwhelm that. You're going to be able to say, mm, I'm sorry, we're going to overcome the fact that this 13-year-old did or didn't understand the consequences of his actions, and we're going to treat him as a juvenile. Now, he's not going to be treated... Um, He's not going to be treated fully as an adult. It's 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 certainly possible though that even someone as old as 13, given their intellectual capacity, could be treated as a child. So we have this kind of intermediate stage where we say, well, you may still be a child, but you may not. But we're betting you are adult enough or responsible enough to be at least partially uh, chargeable. Um, over 14, we're going to presume that you have capacity. That's going to be true in most states. Now, when we say over 14, you have capacity, it's not that you're going to be treated like a full adult. Again, we're still inside that juvenile system. And usually, you are going to be tried in a separate court. Now, North Carolina doesn't quite do it this way. North Carolina kind of does it a little bit cheaper, actually, 
what we do is we take the district court judge or a district court judge that's sitting in a judicial district and we say okay you're going to be the juvenile court judge to handle these cases so you're being tried by a regular judge but that judge is putting on the hat of a juvenile judge and the rules in juvenile court are different um, we're much more interested in juvenile court in what's good for the individual juvenile than we are a lot of other things we're concerned about. Um, now you can kind of see this as a sliding scale if we look at the ages. At the low end of this, if you're seven, eight, nine, you're going to have a lot of evidence, a lot of requirement to really show that you, we should try them. You know, if, if they have a very low IQ, if they have a very low level of maturity, if they have very poor socialization, it, it they're still going to be infants. But you can have people, ironically, who are more adult, more mature, more intelligent, and then they will commit a criminal act, and we will say, okay, well, you're not an infant anymore. You're a juvenile, and we're going to try you as such. Okay, so juvenile court. Let's talk a little bit about that. We, we tend to have, and we have a, we have a class uh, that we teach at Wake Tech, Juvenile Justice. You have to understand that one of the things that juvenile the juvenile system does, and the juvenile system developed starting around the turn of the last century. Um, I think the first juvenile court is in Illinois, if I'm not mistaken, and I believe it's 1899. Um, but by the 1940s, everybody's pretty much got it. Every state has a juvenile court system. And one of the things that goes on is they don't use the same language. So we don't, you know, we, you, you don't use the term delinquency in adult court. Well, you do in a juvenile court. You don't tend to use adjudication, um, you, which again is a, typically a juvenile court. So they have their own kind of different language. Um, even the term disposition, okay? So what we, what we will say is, okay, we're gonna deem that this juvenile is delinquent, which is again, not a term we use at all. Um, and the disposition is, this is what we're gonna do to him. He's gonna go to a halfway house or he's gonna go to a reform school. So these juvenile courts were created because we were getting a more sophisticated idea of how personalities are formed, how individuals mature, and we said, you know, we're just not going to treat these young teenagers like adults. And in fact, we're far more interested in rehabilitating them than we are in punishing them. So states have passed laws to create it. Now, Conversely, there is a strain in American justice that is very much focused on punishment. So some people in particular say, well, you do the, you, you do the crime, you do the time. If you're old enough to commit a man's act, you're old enough to take a man's punishment. So, you know, there is this tension and states will pass laws that will limit. Um, and, you know, some states will say, you're not a juvenile after age 12 or 13 or 14. And other states will say, no, it's later than that. It can be up to 18. Um, and this is really a shift that occurred in the late 20th century where we, we very much went back to a get tough approach on crime and juvenile courts became less concerned with the court acting like the parent in the place of the parent, that's in loco parentis, and more like we're an adversarial system and this is punishment. And this was seen because we thought there was a rise in violent crimes and gangs. Um, there's not a lot of good evidence to show that, that, in fact, there's a lot of good evidence to show it's gone down in the last 20 years. Um, there's not a lot of good evidence to show that, but uh, we act on perception, not on reality. Um, so one of the things that was created after these juvenile courts, which really came in during what we would call the progressive era of the law from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, is a reaction against this and waivers to adult court. So sometimes we made these mandatory waivers. You know, in North Carolina, if you commit first degree murder and you're 14 years or old, you're gonna be treated as an adult. Um, you know, for other crimes, you, you don't have mandatory waiver, but you might wind up as an adult. All right, let's talk a little bit about insanity. Now, insanity, um, is an excuse for conduct um, that really says we can't punish someone because they're not 
responsible for their actions. I think insanity is one of those things where uh, the popular media, movies, TVs, have created a lot of false narratives. Um, first of all, what's the level of insanity? Uh, I think one of the things it's created is it, it's tend to tend to make people believe that mental illness in particular is a binary state. You're either mentally ill or you're not. You're either perfectly sane or you're crazy. Uh, and in fact, what we know is that it can be episodic. People go through periods when they're not mentally competent. It also is a range of behavior. You know, you can have someone that is a little bit paranoid. You can have someone who's very paranoid. Uh, you can have someone that is a little depressed, and then you can go to clinical depression. So what we're looking for uh, here, too, is don't conflate or confuse that um, insanity is used all the time. It's an easy defense. People are getting away with murder by claiming this. You know, the one flew of the cuckoo's nest to use an old movie that I imagine most of you haven't seen but should um, defense. The first thing to remember is it's, it's a very rare defense. Um, now, of course, if the defense of insanity is raised, sometimes the state will look at it and say, yeah, this guy obviously has very severe mental illnesses. We will accept this plea. All right? So when it's used, um, sometimes it's clear that everyone's going to agree, sure, the person's severely mentally ill. And usually that's going to happen because I would say that the bulk of mental insanity pleas are for paranoid schizophrenics. And usually paranoid schizophrenics uh, will see the onset of this disease in uh, adolescence and then it, it, there'll be a long history of contact with the mental health um, professionals. So it's only used about 2% of the time. It's a very rare defense, and it doesn't work most of the time. Also, if you're found insane, um, you, you get a judgment of not guilty, but th there's a little clause tacked on the end. It'll say not guilty by reason of insanity. You then essentially are under the authority of the court still. Since you're insane, um, we can put you in an institution. And now, this, all you have to do is establish insanity and that someone's dangerous. And they're going to have to plead that if they committed a, a serious crime like a murder or a rape or an assault and they claimed insanity, well, they, that means that they have to admit they committed the act. Yes, I committed the act, but I'm insane. So they've really met the second part of the uh, FOCA versus um, Louisiana standard where you, is, you show you're dangerous. Right? So you're claiming you're insane. So it's going to be pretty easy for the state to show, okay, you're it's clear and convincing evidence, right? And then we're going to confine you to an institution. Now, sometimes that confinement can be longer than the potential criminal sentence. Um, so, you know, there is some review of this, but it's really not that well established. So an, another important point here is that insanity is not is not a medical term. It is a legal term. Um, it's only used in about 2% of felony cases, serious felony cases. You know, it's not used for tax evasion, right? Usually 2% would be, you know, violent felonies. Uh, it's only used about 2% of the time, and it's only successful about 26% of the time, which means if there were, uh, there's was about 16,000 homicides last year, there's about 10,000 odd arrests, um, there's about six or 7,000 trials. So let's say 6,000 trials. So 2% of the time would be 60 cases, right? And successful cases would be 15. That means in the entire United States, there were 15 cases of a homicide where someone pled insanity. It was opposed usually by the other side, not always. Um, and they were found not guilty. 90% of those had previous diagnosis of mental illness. And typically, again, if you win, you're going to a mental institution. Now, North Carolina uses a test for insanity called the McNaughton Rule or the McNaughton Test. And we'll see that again in a second. Okay, so 
um, very a few states require the prosecutor to prove sanity but in most jurisdictions it doesn't work that way at all and, and it doesn't work that way here in North Carolina in North Carolina you have a presumption it is a rebuttable presumption but it is a presumption that you were sane then the state says okay you want to claim you are insane you're gonna to have to take this test and I don't mean a physical test you're gonna to have to meet this test that we have to establish insanity because remember we're presuming you're sane you have to prove you're insane so th there's really three major ones and, and the next slide is really going to focus on McNaughton so we'll just hit that very fast that's cognitive incapacity and moral incapacity then there's that your actions were the product of a mental illness and that usually will just show okay you were diagnosed with these illnesses and your action was the result of it and then there's the su substantial capacity rule which really says you know what is your capacity or incapacity um, mentally so put a pin in that one and let's go to the McNaughton test because that's the one for North Carolina so the McNaughton test um, basically it, it's sometimes called the right and wrong test it's essentially testing the individual and claiming they claim that they are not legally responsible because there is a defect of the mind which will be that underlying mental illness a manifest a physical illness like an infection of the brain or a long-term problem chemical imbalance okay that they're suffering from that created a defect of the mind and at the time they committed the crime they couldn't understand the difference between good and bad right and wrong so the idea here is you have cognitive incapacity you can't understand the nature of your act and or you have moral incapacity you don't know the acts were wrong um, it's not an easy standard to apply and it's probably not it, it probably doesn't meet very well with modern medical understandings of mental illness and I think that's really in part because this goes all the way back to the 1800s and we, we didn't know a lot about the uh, mental illness so this is uh, North Carolina this is a Mr. McNaughton I believe uh, this is the McNaughton rule North Carolina standard you're gonna find that in North Carolina general statute 15a-959 uh, what happens is remember the burden is that you are sane so you gotta prove you're insane well you, since you're gonna try to prove something like this in court and since the burdens on you you have to tell the other side so the defense has to say hey here's notice we're gonna plead insanity um, again though you are presumed sane and in order to prove insanity I've got to show I didn't know what I was doing that mental incapacity or I didn't know right from wrong that moral incapacity and that me not knowing that arise arose from a defect of reason or a disease of the mind so uh, the other option is product of mental illness rule and this is not a widely accepted or widely used one uh, basically usually you'll hear irresistible impulse you know an act is wrong but you can't stop doing it if you ever saw the old TV show um, Dexter right Dexter was um, a serial killer who couldn't stop killing he had this irresistible impulse to kill now what he did was he channeled it to kill other bad people so you have a, a serial killer who kills serial killers for example um, and what his defense would have been if he was caught was well I had this irresistible impulse I knew it was wrong but I couldn't stop doing it now this product of mental illness rule begins as McNaughton but because right and wrong are very broad ideas not being able to distinguish it got modified um, the rule can also be modified in something called the Durham test which is not named after Durham North Carolina where you can show that the person is not criminally responsible if his unlawful act was the product of mental disease or defect and you see how that really relates to the McNaughton rule because the McNaughton rule comes in first 
and then these are tweaks to it. But like I said, the McNaughton rules developed all the way back in the 1800s. So, you know, there have been stabs at or attempts really to create more scientifically accurate tests. One attempt here is the substantial capacities test. This is to determine, um, do you have the capacity to understand? Um, you can distinguish between right and wrong or you can't distinguish between right and wrong or you can't conform your behavior to the requirements of the law. About half the states use substantial capacity. Um, most, uh, most psychopaths, and that's really not a term that's used too much in the, the um, medical field anymore, are kind of excluded from this, but about half of states use substantial capacity in some way, shape, or form. Now, there are limits to this whole attempt to plead, this, this whole limit to the insanity plea. Um, here are some conditions that people have tried but basically have not worked. Um, that you are addicted to drug or alcohol and, and that makes you insane. That's not going to help you. Compulsive gambling, television intoxication, premenstrual syndrome, so-called PMS defense, um, cultural defenses. All of those have been tried to kind of shoehorn them into uh, insanity. Uh, it, it's all failed. And I think another problem here, besides the fact that we're still dealing with trying to modify an 18th or 19th century idea about what mental health and mental illness is into the 21st century is, as complex as this is, you've got to explain it to a jury. Because the jury is the ultimate repository of facts. They make the decision about facts. And they will make a decision about this, um, assuming it's not a bench trial with just a judge, and how smart are most people about mental illness? What do they know? So you have the jury instruction problem. Courts have really struggled with what do they tell juries? Do juries understand that? Now some states, there's five here I guess, Idaho, Montana, Kansas, Nevada, Utah, they have simply thrown up their hands and said, no, there's no more not guilty by reason of insanity. You are simply guilty but insane, and we'll handle it after that. All right, what's the consequences of all this? Uh, many states and in federal prosecutions require that if you plead not guilty by reason of insanity, you must be, must, it's mandatory, must be incarcerated in a mental institution. Also, your release date is not set like it is under the law where we say, okay, you're going to serve three years, six years, eight years, whatever it is. You might be there forever. Um, in fact, to get out is you, you're going to have to prove that you are no longer insane and or that you don't present a danger to the public. And there are very specific statutory terms for release. Now, there's been some questions whether this is constitutional, but because it's kind of more in the medical than in the legal, uh, the system has continued to function like this. All right, guilty but mentally ill. Now, this is something that arises in the later 20th century where we say, okay, a defendant is guilty of the crime, um, but they're suffering from some type of mental illness which doesn't reach the level of legal insanity. So if you say, it's kind of like the, the juvenile not being an infant. You're going to say a juvenile is responsible for their acts, but not a, not, they're not a child. They're not an infant, so they're not completely unresponsible. Um, but they're not an adult yet. So guilty but mentally ill says, well, you're not insane, but you're not sane. So a jury in some jurisdictions can find you um, guilty by reason of insanity or guilty by but mentally ill. Now, uh, it doesn't abolish insanity. It just recognizes you've got this gradation. So it's kind of like guilty but mentally ill can kind of be viewed as the juvenile status for mental illness. And again, this is created really to protect the general public against people who have manifested a mental illness that is deemed to be dangerous. Um, 
The state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you're guilty, that you were mentally ill, um, and then the defendant is not legally insane. Now, they don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you're not legally insane at the time. Uh, that's going to be a struggle there. Um, what if you have non-sufficient mental conditions for insanity? Um, there can be things where people say, um, you know, these, these conditions really have affected how you behaved. So probably one of the most famous ones, I think for which there is a great deal of sympathy, is the battered women's syndrome. And there was a kind of a cultural movie or movement, a little bit based off of a, both a movie and a, a few other things called The uh, Burning Bed, where a woman who was routinely beaten by her husband, I believe, and knew that if she waited until he was awake and tried to resist, that he would harm her. So when he passed out and was unable to defend himself, um, I'm, I'm going to simplify this story. He basic, she basically burned him alive in a bed, poured gas on him and sent him alive. And her defense was, well, I was so battered, I'd been beaten by him so many times um, that uh, I, I didn't know what I was doing, right? Battered women syndrome, they're, they're like, a, like PTSD. Um, that's been tried a number of times, but it's almost always failed. And even though there's, it elicits sympathy for the victim, we say, well, you know, you still could have done something else. Now, whether they really could or couldn't done something else, the law is just not willing to say this is a good defense. It's not sufficient for insanity. You got television intoxication. Again, I'm, PMS, cultural defenses. Uh, certainly, you know, some people will say, well, the reason I did this is I was drunk. It's not a defense. Um, nor, nor, you know, compulsive gambling. I had no control of myself, so I kept gambling. Or I had no control of myself because I did drugs. Or I had no control over myself because I did alcohol. None of those are going to be enough. They're not sufficient to operate as a defense. Can they be diminished capacity? It's not a complete defense, but it basically says because of certain emotional or mental conditions, um, you don't possess the required mens rea, the guilty mind, for the conviction of the crime. So sometimes what diminished capacity will do is it will reduce the charge. It'll go from something like, and this, this is theoretically possible in North Carolina. North Carolina first degree murder, for example, uh, you can be charged with that if you premeditate the killing of another human being. So you think about it beforehand. If you could show you were really, really intoxicated, you could claim that you did not have the capacity to premeditate. So you're not going to escape the charge of homicide. You're going to get convicted of second-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter or some lesser offense. But you can say, I was so drunk or so high, I couldn't form the mental capacity to premeditate the crime think about it beforehand because I was just too drunk, too high. So charge me with a lesser offense. That's what diminished capacity typically does. Um, sometimes it can result in a complete acquittal. Um, usually not. All right, so competency to stand trial. Sometimes you have someone um, who, even when they committed the crime, you might have someone who's completely same when they committed a crime. So let, let's take someone who 10 years ago they intentionally poisoned someone which is a first degree murder charge in North Carolina and let's suppose when they did this they were 75 years old. We finally figured out that they poisoned them. We go to arrest them. They're now 85 years old and they're suffering from Alzheimer's. Um, they don't know where they are. They don't remember the event. You would say that they are incompetent to stand trial. Uh, and now, sometimes you have short-term incompetency. Someone is suffering from a temporary episode, can be even being drunk or high or something. But if you're still incompetent after a certain point, you know, if the, the person is still suffering from dementia a week, a month, or is still incapable of, you know, rational thought a week or a month after we arrest him, then we're going to say they are incompetent to stand trial. Now, 
that means that usually what will happen is they will be civilly committed. So let's go back to our poisoner that suffered Alzheimer's. What we're going to say there is um, we're not going to let them go. Um, he's He or she is going to be judged to be non compass mentis, mentally incompetent. And they are going to be committed um, to care. Now, at a some point later, okay, um, you may be competent to stand trial, and you could go to trial. Now, sometimes people are competent enough to stand trial, and they say they want to represent themselves. So the, the old legal adage is, uh, a person who represents himself in a criminal trial has a fool for a client, because nobody should represent themselves in a serious criminal case. But you can have people who are below average, all right, but they're not incompetent to stand trial. They understand right and wrong, but they don't have enough competency to represent themselves because you have a fundamental right to represent themselves, but sometimes we'll say you just don't have the mental capacity to do so. Okay, let's go to the next slide here, civil commitment. Um, persons convicted of violent crimes, and we're mainly talking about people who are, who commit sexual crimes. Um, and these can be some that, that we view much more like an illness. Now, you, you could argue that all sex crimes are an illness, but you know, think about a crime like someone who is a pedophile, someone who has an unnatural attraction for children and rapes or sexually assaults a child. Okay, well, um, we usually will, uh, at least in the general way of thinking about that, we'll say, well, there's something mentally wrong with you. You have formed, a, 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 you know, an aberrant sexual identity to the point that you are identifying with children and you want to have sex with them. Doesn't mean we can't punish you, okay? So if we convicted someone who was a sex offender and showed that they were unrepentant, they said, yep, I absolutely, you know, I find children sexually attractive, I want to go ahead and have sex with them, that's, you know, that's the mental state that I'm in. Well, at this point, um, they could be tried for sexual activity by a custodian. There's a ton of charges in North Carolina, statutory rape charges, statutory sexual assault charges, whatever we're talking about. At the end of that, if they still exhibit the characteristics of this pedophilia, you might say, we're going to civilly commit them because they represent a danger to children. Now, it's not just the person who commits any sexual assault. It's not just even sadly or maybe bizarrely, not the person who commits an assault on children. It's someone who has committed an assault like this and they seem incapable of ever stopping. So the second you let them out, they're going to go do this. What's required is you have to show this person is an SVP, a sexually violent predator, who represents a clear danger that they're going to go forward and do this in the future and that there is a lack of control over their own actions. So you, you, what you're doing is they're not insane, but they're very, very dangerous because they'll commit these sexual crimes. Therefore, what we want to do is we want to hold them. We're not going to hold them in a prison. We're going to hold them in some sort of mental facility. Uh, you don't see a lot of this, to be honest, in North Carolina. All right, let's look at... Criminal liability of corporations. Um, again, we're not going to go too far here because um, it's kind of outside the scope of this course, but corporations for more than 100 years, closer to 200 years, have been viewed as people. Now, that, that strikes a lot of laymen as that's kind of crazy. What do you mean a corporation is a person? Well, um, I think a better term would be they're viewed as a legal entity. Um, but what we mean is, like a person, a corporation can sue in court and be sued in court. It can own property like a person. It can buy property like a person. It can sell property like a person. It can enter into contracts like a person can enter into contracts. It can be sued for breach of contracts. It could be sued for torts. So 
under the law, corporations, for most reasons, are persons. Now, you get to know a little bit of a problem when you start to talk about the criminal law. Because if you think about the, the two most severe things we can do in, under the criminal law, we can lock people up or we can kill them. So we have capital punishment if you commit a terrible crime, or we can lock you up for years. Well, what do we do for corporations? Um, because it's not a person. You can't, you're can't. you not going to take the corporate charter and put it in a box and say it's locked up. You're not going to burn down the building. So most states limit what kind of crimes that corporations can be responsible for. And what they're very often looking for is they're looking for the people running the corporations to be liable as well. So if a corporation uh, does something horrific, like let's suppose you know, a few years back, uh, as an example, some companies, I believe it was in China, um, used a toxic substance in milk. So they were, they were trying to sell milk to children, infant formula, and they filled up some of the bottles, as I recall, with something that looked like milk and could ta pass the taste of milk, but was actually toxic. It, it actually killed some children. All right, well, obviously the people that made that decision, right, have some criminal liability. So if the president of the company said, well, I want to make a million dollars, so I'm going to put this poison in as opposed to milk, you'd say, let's charge him with murder. But also, since he did this through the corporation, you could say, well, we've got to punish the corporation too and maybe set an example. So it's very difficult to apply a lot of these rules against corporations um, because, yeah, you're going to punish individuals, but how do you punish an, an entity that isn't conscious? How do you punish it? Now, there is something called the corporate death penalty. So you can say, well, this corporation was so bad that we're just going to shut it down. We're not going to allow it to do business. It's committed so many crimes that we're, it's irredeemable. And that's called the corporate death penalty. Beyond that, mostly what you do is you fine them uh, or you put them under injunctions where you tell them that they have to do things or like they have to have extra safety inspections of the milk. Or they can't do things like, well, you can still you know, do stuff, but you can't buy and sell milk anymore. So a couple quick discussion questions before I, before I end this chapter. Um, what's the purpose of all this? Why, why, you know, if, and I think you have to understand that corporations occupy an immense level of power in our society. So you're going to have to decide as a society if, if corporations aren't responsible, and if particularly if you can't point to an individual inside that corporation, you're still going to have these terrible wrongs being committed, but you're not going to have anybody to punish. So what kind of crimes are appropriate to charge corporations with? And are there any crimes where they shouldn't be liable? So this is something that has to be weighed, has to be examined by all sides in this. And it's one of the issues of capacity. Or does a corporation have the capacity to commit a crime? Uh, like an individual does, or are they exempt in some ways? All right, well, that's about 50 minutes or so, so not the longest one of our chapters. Whenever you're ready, the next one should be up and running shortly. Have a good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening.